My name is Michael Thomas. I'm a professor of civil engineering at the University of New Brunswick. Um, I've been working in concrete materials since 1983 when I started my PhD. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Aston in Birmingham, since worked for the Building Research Establishment in the UK, Ontario Hydro in Canada, University of Toronto, and now I'm at the University of New Brunswick. My main interests are research into the durability of concrete, with particular emphasis on the use of supplementary cementing materials, including natural parts of lands. Well, just, just at university, it was uh, the, the best opportunity for, for me to do my PhD was in the area of cement stabilized colliery shell. And, uh, you know, that was the, the topic that was available for, with PhD support. So I, I got into it and I got fascinated by it and been working on the subject ever since. Well, it was probably my undergraduate course on concrete materials um, in the early 1980s. I, I graduated my bachelor's degree in 1982, so it would have probably been in that year. I did my senior course on concrete and we, we were introduced to them there. When I was doing my PhD in, in the UK, a colleague of mine, a, a fellow PhD student, was actually working on uh, the use of metakaolin, um, the kaolin coming from English China clays in, in the southeast, southwest of the United Kingdom. Well, it's just part of the history of concrete. You can't really study the history of concrete without really uh, talking about natural parts of lands. I mean, natural parts of lands together with, with lime were basically the first ever hydraulic cements, and they're 2,000 years old or more. So it's really impossible to talk about the history of concrete without talking about them. Well, I, I think, you know, pot, as I said, parts of lands have been around for a long time. Um, they react with the, with the free lime that exists in concrete to provide further calcium silicate hydrates. Um, you know, I, I think historically people have often thought, at least in the last, you know, 50, 60 years, people have thought of Potsalans and other supplementary cementing materials as being a, a cheap alternative to Portland cement. But I think we know now from long experience that the reaction they have with the free lime that exists from Portland cement hydration is very beneficial. And, uh, you know, they can lead to, to, to many many uh, improved attributes to the concrete in terms of just fresh concrete properties, long-term strength, and of course, I, in my mind, durability, increased durability is probably the, the key issue. Uh, properly used parts of lands will extend the life of concrete in, in, in most aggressive exposure conditions. Well, Probably everyone, well, many people would answer this, but it's, it's, it's kind of obvious. Probably the Pantheon in Rome is, is the most outstanding example of, uh, of the use of a porcelain in concrete. Um, you know, the, the dome of that structure is basically lightweight aggregate concrete. The binder is, a, the, the lightweight aggregate is pumice, and the binder is a, is a combination of, of lime and volcanic ash, which is a natural porcelain. Um, that, that wasn't the first use of natural parts of lands. That, that would say, you know, the pantheons built by the, the Romans. But the Greeks used, uh, you know, Santorini earth from the island of Santorini be, be, before that, you know, hundreds of years be, before that. So, you know, the pantheon's a, a beautiful building. It's still standing. The concrete's still intact. It's, it's almost 2,000 years old. It's still being used for the purpose for which it was built. Um, so I would say that would have to be the most outstanding example of existing concrete that contains uh, uh, natural parts of land. It's very impressive, I mean, it, 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 impressive engineering. You know, and, and the Romans were smart enough not to put steel in the concrete. You know, they built it as a dome, so the whole thing's in compression. You don't need steel if the concrete's in compression. And I've no doubt there was steel in it. It might not be still standing today, but, uh, but the, you know, the parts of landic concrete itself is outstanding. And of course, one of, one of the sources of, 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 of that parts of land used in there was, in fact, the, the village of Potsuli. Uh, which is where Potsalans actually got its name. That's one of the sources of the volcanic ash. So, um, well, certainly not structural collapses or anything like that. It depends what you call a, a failure. Um, I mean, most of the time, Potsalans will, will, will improve the durability of concrete. But, but certain Potsalans, and not necessarily natural Potsalans, but certain Potsalans have used at very high replacement levels. Uh, in flat work, um, and, and, and they get exposed to the icing salts and freeze thaw. 
it, it can increase the uh, tendency for the surface scaling of the of the the exposed surface. I, you know, I wouldn't call that. A, it's probably a failure in serviceability, uh, but certainly not a catastrophic failure by any means. And and usually that only happens with a combination of very high levels of replacement and and fairly poor practices. And it is possible to make scale resistant concrete with pavements with with, with parts of lands, but. That would be the kind of you know sort of failure that I've, I've experienced, um, and mainly with fly ash, which isn't really a natural parts of land, but it's still a parts of material. We understand as, as a general engineering community, and you can take the American Concrete Institute as an example. I think we understand durability of concrete much better now than we did 20 years ago. Uh, it's considered a lot more in specifications. We're seeing, you know, sort of end result or performance-based specifications where durability is at the fore. Um, you know, we have improvements in, in, in test methods for looking at things like alkali silica reaction, uh, chloride ingress and corrosion. So, you know, we have improved test methods and improved understanding. And if anything, that, 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 that's really helped uh, develop the use of other, you know, parts of lands like fly ash, like natural parts of lands, also other supplementary cemented materials like, like slag, silica fume. Um, you know, there's increased use of these materials these days because engineers, I think, have an improved understanding that they do, in fact, make concrete more durable. When I, when I went to school in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, durability wasn't really... People talked about the strength of concrete. Yeah, it was all about strength, and, and, and really, there wasn't much discussion on durability. Now I think most uh, university curricula have you know, an improved content on the durability of concrete. Engineers understand it more. We talk about it much more at meetings like, like you know, the American Concrete Institute conventions as well. So I, I would say that things have improved in, in, in that sense. If, you know, it's much more about speed of construction now in, in a great many cases, especially high-rise construction. And, and also, you know, other types of construction too. Um, and obviously where speed is the, the main criteria, so the, the, the quality can suffer. Uh, but I would still maintain that the quality of concrete produced today is better than it was 10, 20 years ago. I would say so, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, our ability to... Uh, just things like the increased use of pots of lands. Um, understanding more about the you know water cemented materials ratio, the need to use water reducers, the, the advent of super plasticizers, all of these have led to concretes with much improved performance. The ability to pump concrete now, improved placing techniques, curing techniques. If anything, I would say, at least the concrete these days has a potential to be much more durable than it was 40 years ago. Well, as I say, when speed when speed and greed really do take over, corners are cut, and I, I, you know, that was probably a problem 40 years ago as well, but probably not as great a problem as it is today. Well, it, it, it kind of moves in waves. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the early 1900s, um, even right up to 1950s, 60s, the, the natural parts of lands were, were quite widely used. Um, you know, so there's a great many structures, the, 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 the San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the California Aqueduct. There's a great many structures that use natural parts of lands back then. The U.S. Bureau started to use them in the 40s and 50s, primarily to control alkali silica reaction. It was understood back then that, that parts of lands had a role to play there. I think the reason that the use of parts of lands has, has sort of died off a bit in, in the latter part of the last century is mainly because of the advent of, of, of fly ash. I mean, people discovered that fly ash was this ready available material. It was a, it was a byproduct or even back then a waste of, a, of another industry and was so cheap and so abundantly available then the demand for parts of lands just, just, just fell off and, and, and then of course we had the, the use of ground granulated blast furnace slag as well so these materials were, were cheaper, more available, uh, often available within the marketplace uh, you know locally and so that I, I think there was a, a well there was a decline in the use of natural parts of lands because of that um, but, you know, we're, we're, it's inevitable that the availability of fly ash is going to decline. Um, we're not going to be burning coal forever. Um, we're, we're certainly seeing, in some cases, in some countries, a reduction in, in the burning of coal. And uh, different types of coal are burnt these days. So we're going to see a reduction in the availability of fly ash. 
different types of coal are burned. Softer coals produce fly ash, which isn't as good as the, the harder coals. Um, it's because of certain regulatory issues, the quality of the fly ash has changed. Um, you know, there's issues with, with things like, uh, you know, capturing mercury. The, you, you, you have all this activated carbon in the fly ash. There's, there's lots of reasons why, I, you know, I think the fly ash availability is going to decrease, and I, and I think we'll see natural parts lungs make, make a comeback. Not enter the market, but they'll make a comeback. They've, they've been around for, for, for longer than fly ash and slag. So I do think there's a, there's a developing, increasing role for, for, for uh, natural parts lungs. Well, yeah, I, I, all, all parts of lungs are different. I mean, even if you look at the category of fly ash, and a, a low calcium class F fly ash is very different from a high calcium class C fly ash. They're very different materials. Glass chemistry is different. The mineralogy is different. Crystalline phases are different. They behave differently. You look at two commonly used uh, uh, parts of lungs, not natural parts of lungs, but silica, fume, and fly ash. Again, they're very, very different. And you look within the category of natural parts of lands, then a diatomaceous earth is going to be different to a, a, a calcine clay, um, which is going to be different to a volcanic ash. You look at the calcine materials, some people might argue that they're not natural because they need calcining, but uh, I, I think we, we include them in the definition of natural parts of lands in most specifications. And, uh, you know, a calcine clay is going to depend on the clay chemistry, the clay mineralogy prior to calcining. It's going to depend on, on the conditions of calcining. So, you know, even within one named group like calcine clay, you can have huge differences. And I, I think that's one of the need, re, real reasons we, we desperately need a performance-based specification to be able to classify natural parts of lungs because they are so different. Um, and I, I foresee us uh, opening up a definition to include some slightly unnatural parts of lands, you know, some processed parts of lands, and, and, and maybe we'll start including things like ground glass and other recyclable materials. Because all of these materials, although they're very different in how they affect the performance of concrete, um, you know, they have different effects on the fresh properties, they have different effects on the hardened properties. The basic chemical reaction of the parts of lanic reaction is, is, is similar. I mean, they're consuming lime, and they're making a, a range of calcium silicate and calcium aluminate hydrates. Uh, so the beneficial, the, the, the beneficial mechanism in how they enhance durability is, is similar. It's just that, you know, we're going to have to use different amounts of silica fume. We tend to use 5 or 6%. Some natural parts of lands we might end up using at 30 or 40%. So, you know, there, there really is a very wide range in the properties and, and the applications and how these materials are used.